Hi everyone. Today I am very excited to share this with you. This is my new frame, the AOS 7, and it's been designed from the ground up to deliver maximum possible flight performance on 7 inch props. In this video, I'm going to be taking you through the design of this frame, all the different design elements, and how they work together to allow the AOS 7 to deliver much better vibration and resonance performance than a typical 7 inch frame and even give some 5 inch frames a run for their money. I'm also going to be showing you the different components that I've used in this build in case you're interested to see what my ideal 7 inch build looks like. And I'm also going to be showing you some black box log analysis to see if all the simulation and design work that went into this frame paid off in the real world. So let's get into it. So some of you might be asking, but didn't you recently launch a 7 inch frame, the AOS Falcon 7? And the answer is yes and no, because the AOS Falcon 7 was actually designed by Conrad Falconer, Falconrad FPV. He is a serious long range pilot and the AOS Falcon 7 is his ideal long range platform for mountain surfing and things like that. I was super excited to collaborate with him on that project and I made a few design tweaks to optimize the performance of the frame for vibration and resonance without changing any of his underlying design. If you're interested to learn more about the Falcon 7, I'll put a link to his launch video down in the video description. But today we're going to be talking about the AOS 7 and this is my design from the ground up for maximum possible flight performance on 7 inch props. So let me take you through the design. I'm super excited to take you through the design of this AOS 7 frame. Now you can see immediately that some of the geometry of this AOS 7 frame is similar to the AOS 5 and the AOS 5.5. It's really building on the benefits of that platform, that triangular truss that provides such good resonance performance. But as the frames get bigger, the challenge of mitigating vibration and resonance gets harder. And that means that the AOS 7 has to incorporate some even more sophisticated design features to overcome the difficulty of having a heavier motor on the end of a longer arm. And that naturally wants to make the resonant frequencies lower. So to combat that, you'll see that not only do we have eight millimeter thick arms, which are obviously going to be incredibly stiff just because of their thickness, you'll also notice that Rather than this triangular truss being cut from a single piece of carbon fiber, as it was on the AOS 5 and the AOS 5.5, you'll notice that there's actually an interlock here and that this strut and this strut are separate parts. Now, why would I do this? Why would I break up this arm into two parts? Well, what it allows me to do is to get the carbon fibers optimally aligned with this strut of the arm and also optimally aligned with this strut of the arm. And that means that this overall truss structure can be even more stiff than what you would expect from just having it cut as a single part from eight millimeter carbon fiber. To lock together this structure really rigidly at the motor, there's a puzzle piece type design in here where the two parts lock together. And then there's also a little plate, little carbon fiber plate here that holds the, the structure together using the motor screws. And obviously the motor mount on the other side does the same job on the other side. So that locks together this puzzle piece structure really securely and means that this arm design can be even stiffer for its weight than any of the previous designs that I've done. The frame design shares a, a lot with the AOS 5.5. It's got these brace plates, three brace plates, one at the front, one in the middle, and one at the back. And that just helps lock these arms together really securely and provide a lot of stiffness against those, those kind of vibrational modes that occur with bending where the motors are moving up and down. All of the same reasoning as to why this triangular truss structure is good is exactly the same as it was for the other frames. In a front loading situation, so let's say you clip a branch or you clip um, a tree or a wall or something. In a normal traditional arm design, that puts an enormous bending moment on the arm. 
And that bending moment causes the arm to break here at the root because that bending stress is just too much for the carbon fiber to withstand. But carbon fiber is much stronger in pure tension and compression than it is in bending. So when you move to this triangular structure, you now have in a front load, one strut, this strut, goes into tension and this strut goes into compression. But the overall bending moment on the structure is nowhere near as high as what you'd have with a single arm. And the result of that is that it's much, much stronger and much more rigid in, in that sort of loading, in that front loading crash type situation. There are also really nasty vibrational modes that get much, much worse with frames as they get larger, where the motor is twisting on the end of the arm, twisting back and forth like this. Having this triangular truss structure provides that wide base and prevents that twisting mode from occurring at the low frequencies that it would with traditional 7 inch frames. So you get much, much better vibration and resonance performance with this design. And then that's only increased by having these aligned carbon fibers on both struts. So there's a front brace and a rear brace, as well as this central brace. So this is the same layout as the AOS 5.5. Because some long range pilots like to carry batteries under the quad as well, I've also put some battery strap slots in this center brace piece. So you could put a, uh, a set of 18650s or another lithium ion pack under the quad here. If we talk a bit about mounting, the motor mounting for this frame is 19 millimeters by 19 millimeters. And there's no option here. Because of the way this arm must lock together, 19 by 19 is the is the only size that the arm will accept. And I think that's really the right size. If you start looking at 16 by 16 motors, you know, your typical five inch motors, they are really too small for a seven inch prop. And so you want to be going up to these larger motors, the 2806.5, the 30 millimeter motors, where a 19 by 19 mounting pattern is the standard. If we look for the mounting for the electronics, we've got three mounting positions, front, middle and rear and each mounting position is exactly the same it has a 30 by 30 stack and a 20 by 20 m2 stack and if you want to mount 20 by 20 m3 hardware you can drill out those holes no problem if we turn the quad over now and look at the top plate you can see that the top plate has all of these triangular cutouts and this is very typical of all my frames these triangular cutouts are designed using finite element simulation to maximize the strength the stiffness and the durability of the frame whilst taking out as much weight as possible up at the front we have a gopro mount and this is exactly the same gopro mounting solution as I've used on all my previous frames. So if you have a GoPro mount for an AOS 5 or an AOS 5.5, all of those mounts will fit this frame because it's the standard 32 by 32 millimeter GoPro mounting. So as we come back, you'll see that there are three sets of slots for battery straps on this top plate. Now, the top plate is quite wide at the center. And the reason that it is quite wide is to minimize the length of this unsupported strut here. By reducing that length, you really help improve the, the resonance performance of the frame and you move those resonant frequencies much, much higher in frequency and make them much easier to filter out. Having this wide central section means that there is a lot of space to mount really large batteries on this frame if you want to fly a long way. And having these multiple strap mounting locations should mean that you'll find the perfect combination of mounts to hold any battery that you want, whether it's a very, very large LiPo or multiple smaller lithium ion packs that you're going to be running in parallel. At the back of the frame, there's the uh, AOS logo cut out, exactly the same as on my other frames. And this is the best area to do this little cosmetic cutout because it's the area that's always under the least stress during flight. And so this is the area where I allow myself a little bit of aesthetics. If we look now at the camera plates on this design, 
you can see that they share the same cutouts as the camera plates on the AOS 5 and the AOS 5.5, which is this double slot for the DJI camera and then these longer slot extensions to allow you to mount other cameras so that they don't have any of the side pieces of the camera plate in view. The camera plates have the same design as the AOS 5.5 in terms of having these two tongue and groove locking points with the top plate. And the reason that the camera plates lock in like this into the top plate in this way is that when you're putting a heavier action camera like a GoPro Hero 8 or a GoPro Hero 9 on the front of this frame, during very aggressive maneuvers, you can get quite a lot of, of force being transmitted through onto this top plate. And to avoid there being any flex or any risk of vibration in that mount, you make sure to have it well reinforced. And the way that I achieve this is firstly by having the four standoffs that lock it to the bottom plate, but then also having it interlock with the camera plates in a way that makes this whole front section incredibly rigid and stiff so that it can support the weight of a GoPro Hero 8 or Hero 9 with no problem. And obviously you you may well be running heavier action cameras on something like this frame because as a seven inch quad, it really is able to carry much heavier cameras than uh, smaller quads without any issue at all. So now I've talked you through the design elements of the frame. I want to talk to you a little bit about assembly and maintenance of the frame. All of my frames, all of the AOS frames are designed to be as easy to assemble, disassemble and maintain as possible. So just like the other frames, all of the arms lock in with only two screws. One screw here, one screw here, and then the arm comes out. So if you do need to change an arm for any reason, it's very, very easy to do. There are only 10 screws on the top plate, 10 standoffs and 10 screws on the bottom plate to assemble the whole frame. Obviously this doesn't include screws for the electronics and motors which are which are separate to that and the motor screws as I said are used to lock together the ends of these two piece arms. Overall this should make the frame very easy to assemble. All of the standoffs are the same length and all of the parts are quite symmetric so there's no left or right hand side for most parts. I'm going to be making spares available for this frame for all of the parts that might need to be replaced. So the arms and camera plates, for example, if you should happen to damage one in a particularly hard crash. When it comes to assembling the frame, I think the only thing that you're going to need to remember when assembling this frame is that it's like the AOS 5.5. The arms go underneath the bottom plate and then the brace plates are the lowest parts that you have to put on. And then if you start with these brace plates and build up from there, adding the arms, the bottom plate, the standoffs and the top plate, you can't really go wrong with the assembly. Now that I've taken you through the frame design, I'm going to take off the top plate and take you through my build of this AOS 7. So let's start with the motors. The motors I'm using are these iFlight Zing 2806.5 1300 kV motors. And I have been really, really happy with all of the iFlight motors that I've used on builds, and they're my go to now. They have some really nice features that, that I think make them stand out. The first is they have an O ring inside here. I don't know if you can see that little green O ring that helps protect the motor bearing against hard impacts. And that can help prolong the life of your motor bearing and keep it running smooth. They also have this really nice machined bell design, which has lots of open area to allow air to flow down through the motor and give it really good cooling. The reason I've gone with the 2806.5 size is that Based on my evaluation of motor stator volume against prop diameter, 2806.5 is just about spot on for 7 inch. 1300 kV may at first sound like a little bit of a lower kV when I fly this quad mainly for freestyle. But what I found is that even this 1300 kV motor 
can easily pull enough current out of the batteries that I'm using with this quad to, uh, to make the battery the limit. And that's where you want to be with KV. If the battery is the limit, and these, each of these motors will pull about 50 amps at full throttle, which means that if you have four of them, then you can pull 200 amps. So unless your battery can supply much more than 200 amps, there really is no benefit to going higher than 1300 kV. If you're running particularly large, particularly high rated batteries, then, I mean, you could try 1500 and uh, see if that makes an improvement for you. But if your battery is not gonna be able to, to supply that extra current, there's no benefit for going with the higher kV at all. They're obviously a 19 by 19 mounting, which fits perfectly on these arms. And they come with a really long cable. So you'll have no issues um, routing the, the wires, even for these longer seven inch arms. The props that I'm running on this frame at the moment are the HQ 7 by 3.5 by 3 props. And HQ actually have two versions of this prop. This is the older version, the V1S. A lot of people are saying they prefer the newer version, which is a, a light gray prop. And I've got some on order. I think really you can't go wrong with either of these props on this frame. A 7 by 3.5 by 3 is a really nice size. It's a, the pitch is relatively modest, which really helps with prop wash. And the props, in my experience, are really well balanced and don't produce too much vibration at all. So, um, yeah, I would definitely say go with uh, the 7 by 3.5 by 3 or something similar for this frame. The next part I want to talk about is the 4-in-1 ESC. So this is the iFlight SuxX 60 amp ESC. And honestly, I think even this might be a bit overkill for this frame and for these motors. These motors pull about 50 amps at full throttle. So this, this ESC has even a little bit of headroom for that. But that should make it really durable. Um, you shouldn't be running any risk of, of burning out this ESC on these motors. And the flight controller that I'm using is the iFlight SuxX D Twin G, which I've used on my AOS 5.5 build and been really, really happy with the performance of it. It has all of the, the UARTs and connections that I would want. It connects directly to the DJI Air unit by way of a plug. It uses USB-C. Um, it uses gyro fusion to combine the information from two gyros to get an even more accurate um, and lower noise representation of how the quad is moving in the air. And it uses an F7 MCU. So you have plenty of performance for running uh, an 8K PID loop, as well as any other bells and whistles that the Betaflight developers might come out with in the future. You might notice with this build that I'm running two XT60s onto my ESC. I have one on the top pads of the ESC here, and I have a second XT60 on the bottom pads here. And the reason for this is that I have found that I have a lot of batteries designed for five inch quads. I have a lot of 1100 milliamp hour success. And the great thing about having these two XT60s is that I can run two 1100 milliamp hour success packs in parallel on this quad. And that is just a perfect amount of performance and weight for doing some really great freestyle. So I would say if you're just looking to get into seven inch and you don't really wanna buy a whole load of expensive batteries, consider wiring up two XT60s to your ESC and then running two of your five inch packs in parallel. And that should be just perfect for this frame. The only comment I would have there is you're probably better off running 6S rather than 4S on a larger build like this on a seven inch because 4S packs are really, I think, going to struggle with, with losses in the ESC and losses in the cabling at the very, very high current draws that you're gonna get on 4S. If we look at the capacitor, I've got a 1000 microfarad capacitor and a Fettec spike absorber on the back of it. And I've been using this combination of parts to protect all of my ESCs recently. And since I started combining the Fettec spike absorber with the 1000 microfarad capacitor 
and mounting them on, on short cables to the battery pads on the ESC. I have, touch wood, had no issues with ESCs failing or burning out. So I think this is a really good solution to protect your ESC and ensure that the, the MOSFETs on there last as long as possible. The video system here is the DJI Air unit and DJI FPV camera. Fortunately, I still have a few of these left over, so I'm, I'm kind of using them up. The nice thing about this is that obviously it connects to the flight controller directly with a plug. And some of the recent testing by Wes has shown that uh, Wes Vardy has shown that actually the range on, on DJI at 1200 milliwatts is really good for sort of medium range, you know, out to maybe 10 kilometers type flying. So you can definitely do mountain surfing and that sort of thing with uh, this video system. An important part of getting good range out of any VTX is ensuring that you try and keep the antennas away from any conductive components of the frame. And carbon fiber is electrically conductive, so you want to keep the antenna away from that. Now, people will often do that by hanging the antenna out the back on a very long, uh, very long stalk. I don't like doing that because it causes a lot of vibration and it will ruin your tune. There's no doubt about it. So I've tried to create this compromise where I've got this quite rigid TPU 3D print here and I've mounted my antenna to it. Now, this TPU print is rigid enough that it's not going to vibrate. It's not going to wobble around. But it holds the antenna away from the carbon fiber and that should give me the best possible range. I'm going to make this print and all the other prints that you see on the frame available on my website so you can download them if you want to use them. Now, no medium or long range quad would be complete without a powered buzzer so that you can find it in case you eject your battery in long grass or something like that. And a GPS antenna. And I've gone with the TBS M8 GPS on this. And again, I've used a TPU piece to extend it and hold that GPS a little bit away from the carbon fiber on the arms and the top plate. And that definitely gives me a good signal. I can get easily 12 satellites locked with this. For the control link, I've gone with this uh, Beta FPV Express LRS receiver. And I've been really impressed with the range and penetration of Express LRS, and I've been using it on some of my other builds. But I've always used this type, the EP2 with the tiny ceramic antenna. Now, for a medium or long range build, I was concerned that this wasn't going to be enough. This tiny little ceramic antenna you can see on top of the board here. So instead, I've gone with this Beta FPV Express LRS receiver, and that has a UFL connection to a full size antenna. And this is the final thing that I want to come back to on this frame is the batteries. This is the battery or batteries, I guess I should say, that I'm using on this frame. Two 6S 1100 milliamp power packs, 120C rated. And I run them on the top plate like this, and I connect one to each of the two XT60 leads. And that for me provides a fantastic solution for aggressive freestyle flying. Obviously, these packs aren't really suitable for long range. You'd be better off with um, a lithium ion pack or maybe an even bigger um, LiPo pack. But for freestyle, this is a great solution. And if you're the type of person who has quite a few five inch drones and quite a few five inch packs, but you don't, you know, you want to try seven inch, two five inch packs in parallel on this frame is a really, really good solution. And then if you like it and you get into it, obviously you can buy more bespoke batteries for flying long range or um, for doing longer freestyle flights. But with these packs, I get at least five minutes of aggressive freestyle and way over 10 minutes of cruising. And I'm sure with uh, more suitable batteries, you could go a lot, lot longer than that. So before I show you the AOS 7 black box logs, I want to talk a little bit about the challenge with seven inch quads and vibration. Seven inch props are bigger and heavier than five inch props. So they tend to be more out of balance and this creates more vibration. Combined with that, seven inch motors are bigger and heavier and the arms of the quad are longer. And that means that the whole frame has much lower resonant frequencies. 
And this tends to amplify problematic vibrations much more with seven inch quads than with five inch quads. And this means that inevitably, seven inch frames have more jello, more problems with vibration, more problems with oscillations than five inch frames. And it also means that you can't tune them the same way. They need more filtering and more relaxed PID gains in order to fly well. Well, no, not anymore. That's just not true with the AOS 7. Here I have a black box log of the AOS 7 Mantis up against the QAVS JB edition, which is a really great five inch frame from a whole bunch of perspectives, but actually its resonant performance is pretty good as well. And you can see that the AOS 7 really outperforms it in terms of the gyro scaled noise. And what that means is that you will be able to tune the AOS 7 as aggressively as a five inch frame, maybe even more aggressively than some five inch frames. And to make this a fair comparison, I've trimmed both these logs to three minutes and we're looking at the roll axis. But the pitch axis is the same story. The AOS 7 has a much lower noise floor across the board. And on your, it's even more pronounced. There's almost no noise on the AOS 7 and you know, still some noise on the QAVS, but this is still pretty good noise performance for a quality five inch frame. You know, you shouldn't be disappointed with this. So what does this mean? It means that if you take every opportunity to improve the vibration and resonance performance of a seven inch frame, you can match or even exceed the performance of even a good traditional five inch frame. And that's going to allow you either to fly your seven inch quad on beta flight stock defaults and it just work perfectly, or it's even going to allow you to put an aggressive tune on that seven inch quad, the like of which you would only typically think of doing for a five inch. And that's going to give you a huge amount more responsiveness, flight performance and confidence to do more aggressive dynamic freestyle moves with your seven inch quad. And if you combine that with the ability of a seven inch to fly further and longer than a five inch quad, you really can get the best of both worlds. And I'm hoping that the AOS 7 is going to enable people to make some really unique and exciting long range flight footage. I hope you enjoyed learning about this, the AOS 7. If you'd like to pick one up and try it out for yourself, I'll put links down in the video description to where you can order one today. Thanks for watching, and until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.